Thank you. Okay. So that's Google Belgium. Uh, I don't know whether you know the character. I just discovered that it's on the screen today, but okay, let's see. I need to go to, I'm sorry. Oh, I have it. Okay, first, thanks to Donald for giving me the opportunity to come here and to, to make a long trip to celebrate Jean-Claude's birthday. I also want to thank somebody who took care of many details, including the parking ticket I got yesterday <laughs> on the windshield <laughs> of the car. <laughs> but of course, the main, <laughs> the main uh, thing I want to say is that I want to congratulate Jean-Claude for his birthday and also for all the work he did. And I can at once say that I consider that I have two masters. And you see, I, I met them uh, in a, almost the same year. In fact, I, I, I knew Francis Buchanan before, but at, at that, in that year, he became my thesis advisor. And in the same year, I met Jean-Claude, who, who came to talk with him and then uh, described uh, a problem to me. And uh, we start uh, working together on the, the first project, the first of all many projects. Uh, in fact, at that time, Jean-Claude, oh, sorry, sorry, was, uh, Jean-Claude Jean was not in Brussels at the time. He, he was just coming back from three years in the state. And he was then at a kind of exotic university in Paris that we all call Nanterre, right? Uh, Vincennes, Vincennes, sorry. And if you want to hear stories about uh, university administration, you should ask him to tell you <laughs> some memories about that. It's uh, really funny. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but that was only for one year, I think? One year. One year, and then you moved to NYU. 70, 71. 70, 71. Then 71, you came to NYU after that. I want also to mention that you spent a year at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. And I'd like to mention that because you were there with Lewis and Duncan. And in, in some way, I watched there the, uh, the birth of the IMBS. Because I remember that Lewis was on the phone for many hours a day talking with uh, the UCI administration and setting up things so that the uh, IMBS could uh, start uh, next year, I think, or? Okay. Okay, and after that, UCI, as we all know. Okay. Now, this is a talk, I will, the title of my talk, and uh, I choose a way to go through many uh, interests of Jean-Claude, and I, I, I thought that Polytope would be some kind of, of glue to put everything together, but not all of the topics of Jean-Claude. You will see that uh, later. Okay, what's a polytope first? One good paraphrase for it is that it is a bonded convex polyhedron. I will explain the terms later anyway. But that comes from a paper by Jean-Claude. I don't know whether he remembers that one. <laughs> yeah. So polytopes were indeed there in the famous paper of 78. That was mentioned this morning by uh, Jeff, and I will come back on the result of that paper in the next slides. OK, it's also interesting to notice that the same paper mentions linear programming. I will also come back to that later, because there are two fields who have been developing parallelly, and uh, it's quite interesting to, to see uh, what happened there. OK, now I want to explain uh, some words in the title, so polytope is explained there, and uh, I will come back on two definitions of polytopes later on. And then what, what is mathematical psychology? I, I'm not going to define it because I suppose that everybody here has his own view on it, so, okay. Uh, maybe it's nice to remember that Jean-Claude is the founder of the EMPG. Maybe you don't know all what it is, so 
the good reaction is to go to Wikipedia and see what the MPG is, and that's very strange because we learned that <laughs> <laughs> Education Media and Publishing Group, <laughs> also known as EMPG, is a holding company registered in the Cayman Islands <laughs> with no operating subsidiaries. I don't know exactly what this means, but okay. But there's e one thing which is even more con I have a lot of money, I guess, there. But what is even more confusing is the next paragraph. Because it, it, it changed its name. And today, together with Magro and Hill, so you all know what Magro and Hill has meant for Jean-Claude in a, a recent time. <laughs> so together with Magro and Hill, it's one of the leading publishers in the education market. So what's that? <laughs> of course, it's not the correct EMPG. The, somebody should create the, the true EMPG page in Wikipedia. And uh, I suppose you all know that it means European Mathematical Psychology Group that really Jean-Claude created in 71 uh, by setting up its first meeting. And uh, as he told me, he selected a good place to have that meeting so that it was very successful. That was Paris. Okay. And I, went, I wasn't there. I cannot tell you stories about the first MPG meeting. But at the time, I started working with Jean-Claude. And the first project I mentioned uh, about the, the question he brought to my advisor was about different measurement. And it came out as a paper in uh, the Journal of Math Psych a few years later. OK, so I mentioned the Feynman 78 papers, paper. and. It, it solved a long-standing problem. If you look at uh, Jean-Claude's paper, you see references going back to the mid of the 19th century even. Uh, but usually, uh, we refer to the Bloch and Marshak paper to explain the problem. And I will do that by using some uh, notation. Here it is. So during all my talk, A will be a finite set of alternatives that I will denote by small letters A, B, C, etc. S will be used in formulas to denote a varying subset of A. And the central thing is the probability that presented with some subset of A, let's say S, the subject chooses one alternative C. And P sub C, S will denote the probability of that choice. So C, of course, has to belong to the subset S of A here, OK? And then we also need random variables. Uh, there will be one for each alternative. And the value of that random variable is to be seen as kind of a utility for that alternative. OK, now all of these things have different status. The domain is given, right? Uh, S is just a notation for mathematical purposes. Uh, then PCS is, oh, sorry, it moved there. Uh, this is to be seen as what is observable in the model and that we want to, what is observable in experiments, let's rather say. And this is what we want to explain in some model. And then to explain things, we'll be relying on latent information, which consists of all those random variables. I mean, one for each alternative. So don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have questions, if I'm not clear. OK, what is the random scale model? Look at equation one there. OK, here. So this says that the probability that alternative C is selected in the set S is the probability on heaven which tells you that the random utility value of C is the largest one among all of the uh, random utility values for the items in S. So that, that's central. You have to really to understand it. But it's a formula, but the meaning is very simple. You select C if it has, at that time, the largest uh, random utility value, OK? Now, to avoid complicated things and to keep with linear orderings, we'll assume that those um, random variables are not coincident, meaning that uh, they take equal values only with probability 0. 
Okay, so just to have um, geometric interpretation, suppose S consists of four alternatives, F sub one up to F sub four, and then the choice has to be S sub third. So what I picture here is all the values of the random utilities at uh, one realization of uh, those random variables, and for C to be selected, that value here has to be larger than the one in the, the one for S2, S1, and S4. But about the other um, alternatives, there could be many other ones. You don't care. They can be anywhere. And there was a necessary condition known for the choice probabilities to satisfy such a model. And it says that uh, first you have this equality, which is obvious. It says that when you are presented a subset S, you need, the, the subject needs to choose exactly one alternative. So, okay, that's clear. And then there is a more complicated thing that was in the Block and Marshak paper, which is uh, an alternating sum of those uh, PCU. So if you look at the formula, you, you must understand that C is fixed. It's always the same C but you vary the subset U. And the way you vary it is just by taking all subsets of the given set S. Given any C and S, you can write one such equation. And it was shown by Brock and Marshak that this is a necessary condition for the choice probabilities to satisfy the random scale model, okay? Now, the theorem says that it is also a set of sufficient conditions. And this is the hard part of the theorem and it is due to Jean-Claude in 78. Okay, we use a slightly different notation, okay. Now, we could ask, is, is there a way to understand in a better way what, what is this thing that you see on the left-hand side of equation four? And there is one, so let's first give it a name, the block marshak polynomial, and the equality is, of course, the block marshak inequality. So can we give an interpretation to, to that alternating sum that appears there? And there is one way to do that. So remember that the model is based on this interpretation if S has only four alternatives and the choice has to be C. Now, uh, as I said before, the other alternatives, they can lie anywhere. Now, suppose that you impose that the other alternatives lie above. So you, the subset S has to be a beginning set of the ranking of the utility values. C has to, to come as the largest one, of course, again. And it turns out that that expression, let's call it L sub C S, is exactly the event, the pro sorry, the probability of that event. So there is a nice interpretation of the Bloch and Marshak expression. Now, when you see that, it's clear that L sub C S, because it is the probability of some event, has to be non-negative. So you get at once the necessity part of the theorem. And you can also see that you can infer, not from there, but directly from the interpretation, the fact that you can express P C S as, as an expression into the L C sub U. So you have two uh, collections of, of values, the PCS and the LCS, and they are connected by uh, formulas. And if you have seen some combinatorial papers, let's say, about um, Möbius inversion, then that we should remind you something. And in fact, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, soon, uh, let's maybe um, say again that uh, establishing sufficiency of the block and Marshak inequalities is hard work and Jean-Claude was able to uh, do that in 78. Now since then there has been another paper by Samuel Fiorini also from Brussels who was able to um, uh, give uh, another proof. So he relied on Möbius inversion but that is just uh, what I showed you on the previous uh, slide and then he, he um, reduced the problem to a problem about network flows and was able to use theorem about network flows to derive Jean-Claude's result. Okay. Now, what are 
what do we know from uh, Jean-Claude's paper is that there is a complete description of the random scale system that is those choice probabilities that satisfy the random scale model first. Second, all of these uh, uh, choice probabilities, they are just the solution of a system of linear equations and inequalities. Okay? And if you look at it more closely, you will see that they form a convex polytope. So it's not only that we have the solution of, that, of such a system, but those solutions form, form a bounded subset, so they form a convex polytope. I'll say polytope for sure in, in the next. Okay, now suppose we, we modify the, the problem and we only look at binary choice, meaning that uh, instead of collecting all choice probabilities, we only collect those for subsets having two alternatives, okay? So this is the uh, official writing as we saw before, but we will abbreviate it into P sub AB, meaning that if you present alternatives A and B to the subject, you will prefer B, and then you take the probability of that event. Probability. So P A B is a probability that subject, when presented with alternatives A and B, prefers B. And okay, the, just uh, inspired by the definition that we saw before, we can similarly define uh, the random scale model for binary choice this time. So it's almost the same. We again have uh, random utilities for the alternatives, and we write down that the probability that B is chosen over A is just the probability of the event that the random utility of B is as least as large as the random utility value of A. It's the same model, but we have restricted it to uh, uh, a smaller set of information, I, I should say. And again, we have non-coincidence. Okay, so again, a little drawing to show you how it's going on. Okay, no question about this? Is it fine? Yes, no. So again, the question is, can we describe all the binary choice probabilities that satisfy this model? Okay. So the problem was completely, uh, completely solved for the, the case in which you look at all uh, subset choices, but here we restrict to subsets having only two alternatives. So we missed part of the uh, global information. We only, uh, only have part of it. And, okay, this is funny because it, it's just writing the most simple things about the model. You can, you can just by thinking, start writing conditions, okay? But, 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 many linear inequalities are known, I will come back on this later, but there is no theorem, no Feynman theorem, I would say, about uh, this case, and it's very puzzling because, okay, Jean-Claude got the, the, the very nice result about choice probabilities in general, but about binary choice probabilities, we know a lot of necessary conditions, but we don't know whether all of these conditions we know are also sufficient. So there was a paper or manuscript first by uh, Michael Cohen and Jean-Claude in 78 that got published only in 90. There is a paper by Marley explaining why it got published uh, so, so later. And they give uh, a very nice condition, generalizing uh, those uh, on the top of the screen there. In between 70 and 90, the same inequality was found by people working in operations research and published in 85. Okay, that's life. <laughs> uh, what is interesting for us is that, again, those vectors of binary choice form a polytope. But this time, it's difficult to really understand the structure of the polytope. We don't know exactly how it works. So, so yeah, so sorry. The ones you listed there, is that the generating inequality? Uh, okay, not the second one, that's just an equality, but the first one and this one, yes, yes. Okay, so I need to explain a few things, but I, I see that you are ready to, <laughs> to see things that you... <laughs> okay, so I'm talking about polytopes, so maybe I should give you a 
two def a few definitions. So there are two equivalent definitions of polytopes. You, you, you can define polytopes as being convex hulls of finite number of points. So you see I, I have here two, four, six, eight points in the plane. I'm taking the, their convex hull. That's a convex polytope, a polytope. But I could also define them as being the bounded intersection of a finite number of closed half spaces. So when you see a line here, you have to see rather a half plane like that, okay, a half plane like that, etc. And any polytope uh, defined in the first way is also a bounded intersection of closed half space. So we have two equivalent definitions. It seems obvious that they are equivalent, but it's not that easy to prove it. I know that from preparing uh, lectures for uh, math students, uh, you have to work to, to, to prove it, really. Now, if you look at, those, at these two drawings, you, there is a remark that you could at once uh, give me that I have eight pounds there, but I could get rid of these two, okay? And if I look at that R space, I don't need it. I can just throw it away and I still have the same uh, region there, okay? So it's also important to remember that the description, the, the, the analytic description of a half space is given by a linear or better affine inequality. Okay, now, as I said, there are things that we can uh, get rid of. Points on the left-hand side, some points on the left-hand side, some have spaces or half planes in the case of the drawing uh, in, on the right hand side. So it's, there are better descriptions given by the two drawings on the lower part of the screen. So we'll uh, make that uh, formal by saying that there is a unique minimum set of points such that the given polytope is the convex hull of that set of points. That's general, okay? And you have to be careful for the other side because if the polytope is not full dimensional, things are a bit more complicated. But it, if it is full dimensional, there is a minimum system of linear inequalities such that the polytope, the given polytope, is the set of solution of that system. Okay? And so it's quite natural to give a name to the points that appear on the left hand side. These are the vertices of the polytope. And those inequalities in the minimum system there, they are the facet defining inequalities, okay? Now if the polytope is not full dimensional, then we have to be more careful. We, we, we lose uh, uniqueness, in fact. But the number of equations will always be the same. It's the dimension of the space in which the polytope lies minus the dimension of the polytope. And about the linear inequality, there will be one per facet of the polytope. If you understand that the facet is a face of the polytope, which is proper one, not equal to the polytope, and maximal. Okay, I should also define phase, but okay, I suppose we can go through. Now, uh, if you think of what we did before going into those definitions about polytopes, there we met two cases, multiple choice and binary choice, and I told you that the probabilities satisfying the model form a polytope. In fact, we know the vertices there. Okay, I should take time to explain that, but the, we, we exactly know the vertices of the two polytopes, and the, the, um, the problem of describing the probabilities obeying the model is exactly to find out a minimal linear description of the polytope. So I, I come from a geometrical, geometry team, so I'm very happy to see that Jean Claude's work turns out to be uh, phrasable in, in geometric terms. And, and geometry helps you understand things here, I think, really. Okay, so as I said, all the multiple choice probabilities satisfying the random scale model form a polytope. And we'll call it the multiple choice polytope. And the notation is quite obvious. We write MULT because it's multiple choice. And then A stands for the set of alternatives. Okay, now with some work, you can find that 
if you denote by n the number of alternatives, the dimension of the polytope is, is that thing, which is exponential. Okay, not very good, but that's life. And as I said, we know the vertices, and the vertices correspond to linear orderings in some way. They encode really linear orderings. And uh, taking advantage of Jean-Claude's result, it's not difficult to find out what are the facet-defining inequalities for that polytope. This was done by Rainer Zuck. Almost all of the um, block marshall inequality uh, uh, come in uh, and they define facets. So we completely know the structure of the polytope. We know the vertices, we know the, the facets. About the binary choice polytope, that's much more complicated, as I said. And Okay, I use that notation for the binary choice polytope, why LO? The reason is that the same polytope appeared in operation research where people want to optimize over linear orderings and they call that polytope the linear ordering polytope. So I prefer to use PLO, uh, okay? Uh, in some sense, I'm, I'm how to say that, split between mathematical psychology and operation research in a way, so sometimes prefer those notations. The dimension that's easy to prove is equal to n choose 2. The vertices are again the linear orderings, but they are encoded in another way because we are using uh, other coordinates, a subset of coordinates um, from uh, the previous case. And many facets are known, so I told you about the manuscript with Michael Cohen that was published later. There are many, many, many papers on that, even books on that. I, I'm not going to list everything. Uh, maybe uh, insist on, on two cases because, on, on, on these three papers, because they connect that problem to other problems in discrete mathematics. And it's always enjoyable to see that what you are studying is linked to other things and maybe you can take advantage of the other research to, to bring new results to what you are looking at. Uh, Koppen was able to build facet-defining inequalities from uh, uh, critical graphs with respect to their stability number. Okay, I have no time to describe what this is. This is really a nice topic in discrete geometry and looking at those graphs uh, give you a lot of uh, facet-defining inequalities. Now, there are two wonderful papers by Samuel Fiorni, the, the one I mentioned before. Uh, one is linking the problem of finding the facets of the linear ordering polytopes to non-orientable surfaces. Wow. Okay? I'm not telling you any more than that. It's a wonderful topic. You have to look at uh, Samuel's paper. Uh, so you know those um, projective planes or uh, Möbius bands. Okay, they play a role in here, but not only them. Uh, other non-orientable surfaces uh, really play a role there. And then there is another paper by the same uh, Samuel Fiorini who presents a, a whole factory to build inequalities. It's very strange. You, you build, we have a whole process that leads you to uh, more facet-defining inequalities. Okay, then uh, we have also been with Samuel and Gwenael Jorin in Brussels, uh, generalizing what Mathieu Coppen did about uh, stability critical graphs uh, by introducing weights and, and getting more inequalities. But there are many more papers, not only in operation research, but also in, in the economics literature about that polytope. Uh, uh, the name of Gilbert should be there also, I forgot to put it, sorry. But, 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 when will that stop? We don't know. And one of the reasons is that there is an MP-complete problem behind, and uh, if P is different from MP, there is no hope to find a simple linear description of the polytope. Maybe there is a complicated one, but no simple one. Okay. Then, just to mention more uh, recent work, uh, we have seen the multiple choice. In that case, the, the subject has to choose what he sees as the best alternative in a subset. But we could also ask him to provide the worst alternative 
in that subset. Okay, so this is the setting of the best worst choice problem. Uh, Louvier and Marley have collected data about that. They want to analyze the data. So there is, again, um, a model. Uh, so what does it mean that if, again, we have a subset of four alternatives and we want A to be the worst one and B to be uh, the best one. So it means that we will be looking at the probability of an event like this one where A is the first one, B is the last one, among the values for the four alternatives. And the other ones, they can be anywhere. Okay, so here is the definition, but it's copied, or it's, it's how to say it, it's, it's built on the first definition we saw about multiple choice. So the probability that A is the worst, B is the best in the subset S, is the probability that when you look at the um, random utility values, the one for A is the smallest one, the one for B is the largest one with respect to all the other utilities for alternatives in subset S. Okay? And again, we require non-coincidence of those variables. Okay? Now, we have met multiple choice with a solution by Jean-Claude. We know that the binary choice is complicated. What about this one? Is it easy? Is it complicated? In fact, we don't know. We are still working on it. There is a team of uh, researchers working on that one. I would first like to mention that we can use a trick as the one we, we saw related to the block Marshak inequality. Uh, so this is the thing we want to explain, but we can uh, replace it by the probability of another event in which this time, you see here, the irrelevant alternatives have utilities that can lie anywhere, but if we require that they are not in between the value of A and the value of B, we have another event. Things look much nicer, I think, because we have an interval there. And you can show that it's maybe better to, to work with those variables. They are again linked with the original ones through Möbius type equations. And okay, this is the team of people I was mentioning, Samuel, Tony, Mike, and uh, oh, Yang. Whoa. But, but, but we are making only, uh, we are making progress only very slowly. We know many inequalities again, but we are not able to prove that they are facet defining. And the main reason is that we essentially we don't know the dimension of the poly two. That's very strange, but okay, we have a huge matrix of zero and one. We, done, we need to know what is the rank of that matrix. And uh, until now, we were not able to do that. Using computers, we were able to find out what it is for at most seven alternatives, but not more than that. Okay, so let's move to another polytope, and it is based on the notion of a bioorder. Bioorder uh, is, is just another name for what uh, André Ducamp and Jean-Claude call B quasi series in a paper published in 69. That was the uh, American period of Jean-Claude, and André Ducamp was there also in one of those universities, right? Uh, so they, they wanted to formalize exactly what is Gottman scaling, and their result is, uh, is this. Okay, so it's maybe a impressive, uh, there are too many formulas, so I will show you what you need to retain from that. You want to describe a relation R from a set A to a set D by assigning values to its arguments in such a way that the value of A is smaller or equal to the value of D exactly if A is in relation with D. So you describe a relation by looking at a comparisons of real values assigned to uh, some relation. And then there is a description of those relations. Okay, you have to spend some time to understand what it is, but it's a four-point condition, meaning that you, 
it's a condition that bears on any choice of two um, elements in the set A and two elements in the set D. I should maybe point out that I'm now looking at uh, relations not on one set, but from one set to another set, from A to D. Okay? Uh, so a relation, as in this theorem, is a by-order, and it's really a way to formalize Gutman scaling. Okay, now we can do with by-orders what we did with linear orderings, and now we'll present things from another kind of approach. If you are given a by-order from A to D, it's a subset of the product set A times D. So being a subset, it can be described by a characteristic vector having coordinates equal to 0 or 1. And if you take the convex L of all those vectors, you get what we call the bi-order polytope. The bi-order polytope was uh, studied in a paper. I will mention it here, yes. Uh, and, okay, I'm not giving you many information about that polytope, but the, the reason to... Um, investigate it is that uh, if you look at the linear ordering polytope or binary choice polytope, it projects onto many bi-order polytopes. So investigating the projection gives you information on the big polytope, and that was the reason for doing that. Okay, I'm not uh, going to tell you a lot of things about that one. Okay, now, if you follow the, the talk, you see that whenever I have a kind of relations, I can as, um, associate to all re the relations of that kind of, on a given set A some polytope. Now, if you look at semi orders, and in this room, semi orders should be well, well known. They were introduced by Duncan Lewis. Uh, there's also semi order polytope, it is full dimensional this time. And it plays a role in the investigation by Mike and Clinton Davis Tober. And we'll hear more about that in the next. No, I'm sorry. Okay. You should learn more by reading their papers. <laughs> <laughs> but they are using semi orders to um, try to check whether um, uh, subjects are transitive in their behavior, right? And so uh, they are really interested in having a description of the semi order polytope. There's a student in Brussels, Selim Rexep, who is working on that uh, polytope. He has found out we think all of the, of the inequalities with a restriction on their coefficients. So it seems that the semi order <coughs> polytopes, polytope is as difficult as the linear ordering one, but we still don't know exactly. We, we have to find some. Uh, and pick complete problem behind that polytope to explain it. Okay, now I have time for mentioning quickly another topic I've been working on with Jean-Claude. This is a paper published this time in a journal of algorithms, and it's about unidimensional folding. I'm not going to tell you many things about that. It's you want to represent in so, for in some way pawns on a line and. and, and not say more than that, uh, but it's very interesting to know that a, a specific family of polytopes play a big role in our investigation. This is a permutoid one, and I'm showing you there uh, the permutoid one in case n is equal to 3. So the general definition is like this. You write these numbers as the coordinates of a vector, and then you produce other vectors, n factorial other vectors, just by permuting in all possible ways all of these vectors. So you see if you start from 0, 1, 2, you will get six vectors that indicate points in uh, three-dimensional space, and then you take the convex L, and what you get here, this hexagon, is a polytope which is two-dimensional case of the permutoid one. So you can imagine what it is in larger dimension. And it's also interesting uh, because all the vertices, again, correspond to linear ordering. So you see there are many, many polytopes whose vertices correspond to linear orderings. 
in some cases we can find the facets of the polytope, some, in some cases we can't. And in this case it's uh, easy to do that, but the polytope has a very, very nice structure. It also ap appears in other topics of mathematics like proxator groups, etc. So it's really useful to know that one. Okay. Why did I leave this? Yeah. Okay. No, so I want to cover as many topics of Jean-Claude as I can. So knowledge structure, you mentioned them. How the polytopes are on there? Of course, yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't speak about it. <laughs> okay, so I need again to, to fix some notation. So Q will be a finite set of items, and Q is called the domain of the knowledge structure. Then we have a collection of subsets. These are the potential knowledge states of students working on that domain of knowledge. And then, uh, because of applications, we need to introduce probabilities, so by the small letter pi I will denote some probability distribution on the set of all states. There will be also for each item in the domain the probability of a careless error, meaning the student who is in a knowledge state that comprises the item Q in principle gives a correct answer, but maybe because he's uh, working too fast or he's making some careless error, it will produce a wrong answer. And assume we denote by beta sub Q the probability of such an error. And uh, to the opposite, there could be also lucky guesses in answering uh, items. So let's uh, write eta sub Q for the probability of such a lucky guess. So we have these two numbers coming in for each alternative Q, uh, sorry, not alternative this time, each item Q, and we have a probability of, for each um, knowledge state uh, in the collection uh, script K. Okay? Now, if we collect all these things together, we have what, what we call a parameterized probabilistic knowledge structure. Okay. Now, uh, in the next slides, the role of those things will be uh, different. I will assume that Q and K are <coughs> given, but that pi, beta, and eta can vary. O of course, when I'm writing beta, I mean a vector of beta sub Qs, okay? There is one coordinate for each item Q. Is it important that uh, K doesn't be empty set of Q? For the time being, no. Okay. That's, that's again, uh, how to say, uh, the law, <laughs> or again, uh, or so custom, but... Yeah, I, and, and I'm not putting at this time any restriction, okay? Uh, so in, in uh, our first book, and in the second one also, we find um, a model for the correctness of answers given by a student on the items. So how should we define the probability that the student answer correctly item Q? That will depend whether he's in a state that contain, uh, the, oh, sorry, this should be Q and not C. You mean, you see what happened. I copied from the first part of the talk to the second one, a drawing, and I forgot to correct this into Q and the same here. But you see, there are two cases. Either the state contains Q or not. So, ready for a formula? So, the probability that the, the answer to Q is correct will be uh, formulated as depending on the state in which the student is, and we need to define uh, this conditional probability, and we'll do this by first uh, decomposing the sum uh, into two uh, subsums, depending on whether the state contains Q or not, and then uh, there is a definition of that here and of that there. And that definition is very simple. In fact, it's just capturing what I said before. If, if the student is in a state K that contains Q, he should answer correctly, except if he's making a careless error. And if he's in a state that does not contain Q, then the only way to answer correctly Q is to make a lucky guess. Okay? Now, it's 
a feature of the model that we decide to introduce is that the beta sub q, they only depend on q. You could imagine that they should also depend on the state in which the student is. But okay, forget about that, make the model simple. So because of that, we can put this in front of the sum. We, and again, the same thing happens here. And then it's uh, natural to give a name to all the um, states k that contain q, we uh, denote that subcollection of k by k sub q, and again here for all the states that do not contain q, uh, we write this. Okay, so let's start from a knowledge structure. Whenever you introduce those uh, probability distribution pi on k and beta q, eta q for the items, you get that formula giving you the probability of a correct answer to Q. Another problem is to characterize the collection of vectors that you get in that way. And the characterization has to rely on what the knowledge structure given at the start is, of course. It will depend on that. Uh, that's a difficult problem. And it's maybe time to point out something which is special here that I didn't meet before. In all the models that I was describing before, there was some linearity underlying it. While in this case, we are multiplying things. And that makes all of the problems much, much more difficult. So to get rid of that, there is an easy way to do that is to set eta sub q to 0, beta sub q to 0, so that we get what we call the straight case. And this uh, equation uh, gets much more simple because the second term there disappears. The first one becomes just the probability of the collection k sub q, which means the sum of all probabilities of the state containing q. OK, now remember that pi here has to be a probability distribution on a set of states. So it, uh, the values of pi have to be non-negative and they have to add up to 1. And because of that, it's easy to see. Because th that formula expresses two tau of u as a sum of things like that, that the vectors tau again form a polytope. And it's a zero one polytope. So that I sh could have said before is that all of the polytopes we have met until now, they have a special property that all of their vertices have coordinates equal to 0 or 1, so they are what we call 0, 1 polytopes. Oh, oh, maybe. Right. OK. OK. Correct. Thank you. Forgot that one. <laughs> OK. But it's not mentioned there. OK. <laughs> OK. So all, all of these, except for the permutoid one, um, are 0, 1 polytopes. So that's not a good problem, because it happens that if you let you, you allow k to be any collection of subsets, then here you will get all 0, 1 polytopes. And we know that some of them are easily describable and other ones not. OK? So it's usual to put some restriction on the collection of states, to, to impose that the empty set and the full domain are states. But it's easy to show that that does not simplify the, the problem we have here. We, we get almost all of the binary polytopes again. And OK, I'm not going into details, but that does not simplify the question of describing all of these polytopes. But if we respect now to learning spaces, those that we met yesterday in David's talk, uh, they are also called antimatteries. And there is a paper about those uh, polytopes, in fact a paper by Corte and Lovach in 89 that describes some of these polytopes. I mean, for some families of learning space or antimatteroids, they were able to completely describe the facet structure of the polytope. But not for all of them. Okay, so there are still cases in which we don't know how to describe the polytope. And there is PhD students, Ken Merckx in Brussels, who is studying this. 
Okay, now to summarize what uh, we saw until now, multiple choice polytope, tractable as proved by Jean-Claude, then polytopes coming from relations, some of them are tractable, some are not. And if you look at general knowledge structures, it's a problem which is not interesting because we may meet all of the polytopes from before and okay, it doesn't make sense really to look at that problem. Now, if I have enough time left, I don't know. How much time do I have? Five, Five minutes. Okay, I'm not, I will not be able to cover things here, but I want maybe to start saying a few things because they connect to Jean-Claude works on other topics. Uh, so I'm back to the original notation with A, a set of alternatives, but this time R will be a fixed relation, exactly as when I define by orders. And think of R on that set as being a preference relation, and you should think of it as a strict preference relation. Now I'm using R to denote the relation, but you could think of it as less than uh, strictly less than for that relation. So we, we are given utility values and also a threshold used in comparisons. And the interval order models requires that, sorry, uh, B is preferred over A exactly if the utility value of B is larger than the utility value for A, but even larger than that utility value plus the threshold, okay? So this is what is shown by the drawing there. There is a result by Fishburne on one hand and Merkin on the other hand, describing all of these, uh, or characterizing rather those uh, relations. And if you look at it, maybe you remember the definition of bio, it looks like that. And in fact, uh, those relations that are called interval orders and that were described by the, this uh, very famous paper by Fishburne, they were in fact in the paper by André Ducamp and Jean-Claude the year before, because it's just a particular case. Okay, now oh, I have to be quick, I'm sorry. Um, this is our model, the, 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 the picture for our model. B is preferred over A if utility of B is larger than that, but now let's write X prime sub A for that sum. So the X sub A are the um, original uh, interval endpoint, and, or let's say the left hand side uh, endpoint, and the X primes of A are the right hand side. So you can rephrase the representation that appears that appear in the theorem uh, in this way. So we say that we have a representation of an interval order if we have a 2n tuple and n is again the number of alternatives so that if b is preferred over a we have this strict inequality and if you negate that then you, by contraposition you get uh, the reverse inequality. And we also require that uh, the utilities are non-negative. But there is something which is not nice here is that we have large inequalities and uh, strict inequalities. So to uh, avoid that problem, we introduce an epsilon there. So th this allows us to replace strict inequality by large inequality. Epsilon is fixed here. Okay? So let's denote by C sub epsilon the collection of all the epsilon representation, I'm, I'm understanding that I'm very fast here, sorry, but maybe if you can understand everything, at least the result is interesting maybe, is that the collection of all those epsilon representations, they form a cone, not um, with the, it vertex at the origin, but it vertex, vertex at another point, and it's a, uh, pointed polyhedron, it doesn't contain any line, but it has only one <coughs> vertex. Okay, that's nice. So this is called our epsilon representation cone of the interval order R. Now, what is the vertex? It comes from what I've defined as the minimum epsilon representation of that interval order years ago. And to show, to give you an idea of what the uh, minimum representation is, let's start from that 
interval load. I, I mean, I'm giving you a representation by intervals of that interval order. What is the minimum representation of it? It's here. You see, you have to push things to the left, not going farther than zero. And you have also to, to respect the uh, presence of, of the epsilon. So the endpoints of the intervals, they come on a scale, uh, integral multiple of epsilon, and that's OK. Now, what are the extreme rays of the cone? So an extreme ray is, is OK, I don't, I'm not going to define it, but just to show what it is. OK, that's the minimum representation. And let's now produce an extreme ray. Here you see an extreme ray, OK? Going to infinity. So what did we do to get that uh, extreme ray? We had to cut somewhere here and have all these things moving to the right. But OK, you have to look at where you can cut. And OK, there are results about that. Uh, they are due to, um, to me and a uh, former student in Brussels. What about semi-order? Let me take two minutes about that. Uh, semi-order, you get them by imposing that the, the representing intervals have constant length. There is a famous theorem of Duncan describing those semi-orders. We need to use what was used for interval orders, and then we need to add another condition. So semi-orders are relations satisfying these things. Then what is an epsilon representation of a semi-order? It's something that you do exactly in the same way as you did for interval orders. But this time, we have only n values plus a value for the threshold. OK, you see from xa to xa plus sigma. And then here, you have an epsilon that comes in. Denote by d sub epsilon the collection of all epsilon representation of the given semi-order. And that was technically difficult stuff. We are able to prove that we have a polyhedron, not a cone this time. It's a polyhedron. There, are, there, there can be many vertices here. And a nice property of these vertices is, is that they have all their coordinates integral multiple of epsilon. The same holds true for selected vectors for the extreme rays. And we can also define the facet. I'm not going into details. There are things that are known as hollows and noses. Uh, they were more or less introduced in Marc Pirlo, and the full definition comes in a paper with Jean-Claude. And the minimum, one of the vertices comes out of what Piro uh, defined and, and, and proved to exist, which is called a minimum representation. Okay? But there are some orders for which we have a lot of vertices. There are some orders for which there is only one vertex. And no combinatorial interpretation is presently known for the vertices. So it's time to conclude. So I hope that I was able to show you that polytopes and unbounded polyhedra can be useful in mathematical psychology. And they are there in many of the topics on which Jean-Claude has been working, but in, not in all of, of, of his topics. For instance, I wasn't able to find polytopes in meaningful scientific laws. <laughs> Uh, OK, what I didn't cover is that there is also a way back. I mean, there are techniques now in operation research for the investigation of polytopes. And you can use them to investigate the polytopes within mathematical psychology. And in fact, uh, total dual integrality was used in our paper on uh, the polyhedron of epsilon representations. OK, my title was maybe a bit misleading because I'm not able to cover all of the polytopes that appear in mathematical psychology. So I need to apologize. Mike told me that he's true. There will be one that I didn't cover. <laughs> but you will be uh, seeing it maybe in his talk next. And that's it. Thank you. We have time for a quick question or two. So the semi-order.
apologize. You said sometimes they can have only one vertex. Yes. Sometimes they can have more. The, the interval, well, I think it was the interval polish up, there's only ever one vertex. One. And all of the other fast cases are unbound. Yep. In the semi ordered polish up, is there any restriction on what dimension of the faces can be bounded versus unbounded? Or oh, the number of them, you mean, or the? Can you have unbounded facets? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, bounded facets. Oh, bounded. Fa uh, yes, yes. Yeah. And we don't really understand how it works. And in fact, I, I must say that the, the, the paper on the semi-order polytope is the, the most difficult one I have been working on. It's really difficult to. See how we were, it's it, it's it's very curious because it's a simple problem. And why do we use those? techniques from operational research to solve a problem which should be solved in a much simpler way. I, we weren't able to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, in, the, in the random utility case, can you, can you characterize what sorts of things can and can't be represented this way? For instance, the top two probably can be generated. You, you did the top and the bottom. Oh, yes. The top two, but uh, whether or not it's above the for each problem, I really need, no, I, I cannot give you an answer at once. Uh, I should really look at the problem and, and see uh, of which kind it is. And uh, you, you saw what, some have, are easy, some are difficult, but uh, I don't know of any way to, to put them apart. Uh, Irrespective of the difficulty, yeah. Ah, whether it would lead to a polytope. Oh, yeah, I have to understand exactly what you, what you want. And, uh, but if, if, if you introduce those models by uh, taking probabilities of comparisons of random utilities. I bet that you will get a point. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I suspect that what you have in mind is what John Bamber and I uh, looked at very carefully in the signal detection problem, uh, which is a ranking test, so that you not only nominate your uh, most Ah. John, well, I, very quick question. Yeah. Does it make sense to yeah, yeah, Mike, Mike, in, yeah. in the random utility, the basic random utility model, does it make sense to allow the set to uh, be infinite? It makes sense, and there there have been papers on that by Hans Colonius, okay. but uh, I never looked at that, and uh, I, I don't know whether you can go f further. I, I don't know. I I just know that. Uh, Jean-Claude raised the problem in his paper, and that Hans Colunis uh, has been working on it, and he has a paper, but I'm sorry, I cannot tell more than that. But for semi-orders, there are issues there where you no longer have a numerical representation by utility, it's the cardinality. Uh, yes, but you can uh, add one condition. And there, there is recent work by people from Spain that completely solves the problems. They know what to add so that you still get uh, real representation.